Avast, behind, and welcome to the Gentleman's Sea Captain's Guide to Aquatic Threats. In today's public service announcement, we are going to be talking about one of the most pernicious, dastardly, terrifying threats to rack humanity in this pressing time. The Brain Eater Eel. Oh, the scientists have got a lot of different names for them. They like to study a creature's genus, where it might come from, its various sequence and so on. But we are not boffins. We are men and women of the sea. Therefore, we call it as we see it. They eat brains. They're eels. They are brain-eater eels. And so, that is how the majority know them. But they're still not known well enough at all. Because these invaders, that is their subtype, are a subtle, they're a discreet and, as I say, quite terrifying threat. You do not know that you're in the presence of a brain eater eel until it comes time for the brain eater eel to attack! An incredibly subtle enemy. They are not like centipus. You will not hear them coming. You will probably not see them coming. But if you listen, to my words, if you watch this recording, you may get an idea behind how to spot a brainy eel before it's too late. Allow for a history lesson. Our first sighting of a brainy eel was inside the autopsied body of a giant seal slug, another alien creature that we will cover at a future juncture. Whilst dissecting the giant seal slug, I am told that the scientist in charge discovered one of these eels coiled up in the skull of this hulking creature. It had been piloting the seal slug, which had been acting erratically whilst alive, as if I might captain a boat. Coiled around the brain stem, having eaten the majority of the rest of the brain matter, and absorbed much of the giant seal slug's fat, which we will get on to. This brain eater eel had hollowed out a host and was preparing to invade. Now you may wonder what would a brain eater eel be doing inside giant seal slug, and frankly we cannot know. Neither of them were talking. We can make certain assumptions, however. Perhaps the giant seal slug was claiming territory important to the brain eater eel. Perhaps the Brain eater eel had never encountered this species before and wanted to know how they worked. Perhaps there is some kind of symbiotic relationship between the two creatures that we do not yet understand. I'm no scientist, and I place no faith in science. My faith goes to God Almighty and Poseidon below. And frankly, the rest can hang. But sorry, I get carried away. The brain eater eels. When they were first discovered, you know what we should have done? We should have called for an all-out pogrom like our Soviet cousins might. Burn their little colonies to the ground, track them down, eliminate them as a species. Because surely they could do no good. But scientists, scientists, you can never trust them. They decided to go a different route. The CIA and their eggheads, they elected try and use the brain eater eels as a new form of espionage, a new form of behind enemy lines weaponry. If we could control the brain eater eel, perhaps we could get them in the heads of enemy agents, enemy politicians, enemy military commanders, maybe even inside the heads of enemy scientists, bring those scientists back to our lines to spill their information on rockets and bombs to our people. It was such a hubristic, such an arrogant attempt. I cannot fault their ambition, mind you. You know, in war we are always looking for an advantage over the enemy, but to use a brainy to eel for it just seems so vulgar. Needless to say, it didn't go very well. While the brainy to eel certainly showed capacity for controlling its victim, whether giant seal slug, human, or cow. It showed no willingness to be controlled by a third-party human, such as a CIA agent. The G-men in this case failed in their task miserably. And what had occurred was a lab full of brainy-to-eel-infested hosts 
became loose, and the CIA lost track of them, and therefore America infected itself with brain eat eels. Many actions have been taken in that former colony of ours in the Americas to try and remedy the situation, track down the hosts of these brain eater eels and stop them from proliferating, but it is quite difficult to do. And you mentioned, or you may have heard me mention earlier, that these brain eater eels are pernicious. They are discreet, they're subtle. You do not know a brain eater eel is about to attack before it attacks. Unlike Centipus, you do not hear it, you do not see it coming. But, I know, it is something I often say. I often compare things to Centipus. Centipus is big, Centipus is much loved. I understand you can even buy little toys of Centipus now, but only in ports where Centipus has not attacked. I get carried away. The brain is ill, of course. The Americans lost track of their infested agents, but that was not all of it. You see, the brain eater eel was a craftier creature than we ever anticipated. Something so small could be so intelligent, to be so calculating. They had wanted for this all along, according to Dr. Uriah Herman, a noted mad scientist. They had been hoping for an introduction to powerful, to influential humans. And so when I was told the story by Dr. Herman about how the brain eater eels were not just infesting our government's agents and America's government agents, but also the Soviet government agents. Then that gave us cause and pause for thought. Was it possible that a third party threat, an alien from the deep, could possibly unite? Britain, America, Russia, and the rest. After all, all of us were at risk. This could be the opportunity that humanity needed to come together and repel an alien threat, because in many cases, whether talking about Gilkin, Aquatapillars, even Centipus itself, they attack in localised areas. When they attack Vladivostok, the people in New York laugh. But the brain eater eels were all over. Could this be the deciding moment where humanity puts aside its political and philosophical differences and fights back? Could it be? Could it? No, 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 it couldn't. And it didn't happen like that, unfortunately. It was a grand moment, a glimmer of hope. It was discussed frequently, shot down, stamped out, set on fire and flushed away. The idea of working with the Soviet menace was as anathematic as uh, giving in to the brain eater eels themselves. So, the Americans and the British, we decided to leave the Soviets their brain eater eel infestation problem, to the point that I understand Stalin himself, who by all rights should be dead by this point, has one inside his head. I do not know how endemic the problem is, whether all Soviets now possess brain eater eels, I doubt it, but who could really tell these um, mindless marching communists, really, there's not too much difference, whether infested or not. I mentioned how subtle these creatures are, and there are signs, there are symptoms that you can pick up on, as an expert like myself, how to spot someone with a brain eater eel inside them. It is not so simple as the little eel that pokes out an ear and goes, Hello! Ah, uh, how easy things would be if that were the case. Sadly not. The fact of the matter is, they put various strains on a human body. I once knew a man uh, by the name of Captain Abernathy. You may have heard of him. A great old salt. I had a lot of respect for him. He was very strong of bicep and tricep. Knew how to steer a boat in a storm, that's for sure. I spent many an hour below deck with him, playing cards while a storm raged above. Well, he was the first to chronicle some of the symptoms of a brainy to eel infestation. Number one, the host will cease smoking, drinking alcohol and taking 
drugs, whether beneficial or otherwise. Two, the brain eats eel will compel the host to start consuming excessively fatty foods. In this time of post-war rationing, you can imagine that's a fairly difficult uh, thing to do, but in America especially, where these uh, foods are in surplus, you can find someone infested with a brain eat eel hotly chasing down donuts and deep-fried chicken. Three. The host containing the brain eater eel will strive toward world domination. One could argue that is the most obvious sign, but it depends on who the brain eater eel is inhabiting. If the brain eater eel is in a well regarded politician, for instance, or a military a, uh, commander, how could one? see the difference. But if the brain eater eel is in a housewife, or every man, you know, a blue collar hero, well, in such a case you might notice when that individual suddenly starts pining for taking over the local town, community, village, or simply parish. There are various ways ascribed by Captain Abernathy and indeed the mad Dr. Uriah Herman for how to extract a brain eater eel without harming the host, and I believe there is a time limit on doing so, I'm no expert here, but rumour has it that if you can do it in its early stages, before the brain eater has eponymously eaten the brain, you can reliably expect the victim, whilst shell-shocked, to go back to uh, smoking and practicing other healthy behaviours such as that. I knew someone once with a brain eater eel inside their head. Her name was Nancy. I was close to her for a while. There are few that understand the hardships of life on the sea or facing alien threats, and this Lady Nancy, well, she was a survivor. She knew what it was to grow up in an area beset by war. She grew up in Singapore before and during the Second World War, and after enduring a life such as that, you would hope that she would have been given a free pass for the rest of the century. We grew close, Nancy and I, for just a brief period, a magical period. Captain Abernathy was not in my life at that point either, but we went out sailing once, and while I was napping on the deck, taking in the sun's rays as I am wont to do, what I did not understand was that a brainy to eel had climbed aboard. Oh, how I wish it had discreetly snuck up my nose or into my snoring mouth. Coiled around my brain instead, but no, it went for Nancy. Nancy as she was shucking oysters. I wish she could have defended herself well with that knife, but sadly, she did not. When I awoke, I found her gorging herself on lard and butter, and immediately I knew something was wrong. This was not like her at all. All I could do was ask her, do you have a brainy to eel inside your head, Nancy? I could think of nothing else. Maybe I panicked. That's how I delivered it, and I do not consider it a panicked statement, but that's how I delivered it. And, in fairness to the brainy to eel, she said, Yes! At which point Nancy jumped overboard and I never saw her again. All I can hope is that the brainy to eel gifts its host some kind of aquatic breathing ability, and one day she might wash up and I can save her. But no matter how well I tried to fish for her that day, she never took my bait. For all I know, she is still swimming around there now, waiting for me to return. So you see, my stories of the brainy to eel are personal as well as political. They may be infesting people in as high in station as Joseph Stalin and as red-blooded and true to humanity as good old Nancy, my sailing partner for but a couple of days. If you see an eel crawling on land, sneaking its way up your drain pipe, you put that eel out with a cigarette butt or with a particularly loud scream. 
You call your local constabulary. You get them to thwack that eel over the head with their truncheons. You drive them back to the sea until we can find a way to eliminate them as a species. Because if there is one thing worse than a communist, it's a brain-eater eel. <laughs>